surgical removal because some things just got to go <laughs> surgery especially for a cancer you know you can always cure cancer with surgery the only question is whether the patient will still be alive uh, you know if you go if you go deep enough you can get rid of it all including the patient yeah so it's an if it's an if but nonetheless there are times and there are things that just got to go so we mentioned briefly uh, dr. Kellogg's bad side um, oh boy there's a whole bunch of, of interesting stuff this is um, this is more uh, found in uh, in uh, two other books I wrote tremble and tactics um, but <clears throat> Kellogg is more tightly linked to demonic control than anyone else in the spirit of prophecy it's like there is absolutely no question the way she describes Kellogg um, and I wish I could get all that story in but I, I'm sure I don't have it all <clears throat> but um, yeah she describes seeing his attendant hovering about him I don't think that the way she describes is not literally like elevated you know or, or levitating hovering type that I don't think that's what she but always at his side you know and and this was the devil she wrote to the general conference president and said you are not dealing with John Kellogg you were dealing with the one who was once the covering cherub in heaven um, the words that come from his mouth are not his words it's, it's very very strong linkage and that's obviously a problem um, and the interesting thing is that at the Lord's direction he was dealt with as patiently as he was uh, we'll see some examples of that but this is the most fascinating thing when you get into reading the detailed accounts um, let me give you a warning for whatever it's worth <clears throat> I was um, I was researching a book and I'd actually had probably 80% of the book written and thought I was going to finish it up and then I remembered one particular letter that had been written to Dr. Kellogg and I really that was, it, it was written by George Butler in like 1904 I think it was and um, it had a great thought to it and I, I really wanted that thought in the book but in tracking down that letter I um, I reminded myself I'm sure I'd seen this before but I reminded myself that all of Dr. Kellogg's correspondence is held in archives at the University of Michigan or no Michigan State University in Lansing so I got in touch with them and yes uh, it was all available on uh, microfish well, I don't have a microfish reader and I don't have that kind of patience either um, but uh, <clears throat> some months later I actually was invited to uh, Lansing and I, I spoke there in the church and so I spun on over to the university there and by that time sure enough they agreed to give it to me on a USB stick as PDFs <clears throat> and that raised a real question in my mind because Dr. Kellogg's words were not the words of Dr. Kellogg and I was pretty sure that extended to his writing too and um, Ellen White's very clear about Living Temple don't read the book Uh, 
I'd never read the book. I didn't feel like I wanted to read the book. Seems like good counsel to avoid reading the book. Now, should I read his letters? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a tough bind. You know, you're trying to research a book and you want to be responsible and, you know, all that sort of thing. You want to be thorough. You want to be accurate. But do you want to expose your mind to this stuff? So I'll tell you what I did with no pretensions that it was the perfect choice. I decided that before I read Kellogg's side of the story, I would read everything that Ellen White had written to or about Dr. Kellogg covering a span of uh, <clears throat> 19 years, I guess it was, from 1892 to, uh, to, uh, to 1907. Uh, there are boundaries that made, seem to make sense to me, so I, I guess that's 15 years. But yeah, whatever it is, yeah. <clears throat> and, and you know what? Uh, there was a lot more of that than I knew there was. It probably took me six months of some pretty dedicated reading time, sometimes like four hours a day, to get through everything that she wrote to or about Dr. Kellogg. And then I started reading Kellogg's letters. I'm not sure I did the right thing or the smart thing, but I would say this. I'm glad I did what I did, at least as far as reading the Ellen White part. <laughs> uh, I would not recommend anyone to read Kellogg without at least doing as much as I did. The guy's very, very good. He may never have read How to Lie with Statistics, but he was... <laughs> he was sure good without statistics. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, <clears throat> And he can present a picture that just makes you feel sorry for it. Everybody's against him and nobody's giving him a fair break. And there was some truth to it. But anyhow, nonetheless, one of the things that I discovered in that researching was that there was a whole story that had never been told. It's like, how is this? You know, if I were to ask you, and I don't know what level of you know, Adventist history, interest and involvement in reading you've done, but if I were to ask you, what was the event that broke the back of Kellogg's Rebellion? Can anybody point to a single event? Do you, do you remember a story of anything? What led him to rebel? No, what, what, what broke the back of the rebellion and saved the church, so to speak? And remember a, an event? Nope. Long after that. How about the burning down of the, of the publishing house and the sanitarium? That all happened in 1902, but nope. This rebellion was going stronger after that, actually, because when the sanitarium burnt down, February 18, 1902, Kellogg said, we're going to rebuild. And nobody else was in a position to argue with him. But he said, we're going to need some money, and the General Conference was not in a position to give him any money, so he came up with a plan. He said, you know what, guys? I've just now finished up a book. And here's what I'll do. I will donate all of my royalties. Let's get the review to print it at cost. Let's get the, the co-porters to sell it gratis. And, and all that accumulated profit will go to the sanitarium. And the General Conference Executive Committee said, what a wonderful idea. And they said, let's do that. And so he handed over the manuscript. That was Living Temple. And they commissioned a small com subcommittee to read the book for individuals, Kellogg, Paulson, McGann, I think it was, and Prescott. And they read the book, and in a rare... What? Yeah, Kellogg was on the committee, so they could ask him questions. Oh. Yeah, right. And uh, in, a, in a, a fairly rare event in Adventist history, the committee came back with a majority report and a minority report. Well, you've only got four members. <laughs> so you can kind of well figure out what the split was, <laughs> okay? 
And the majority was three. Kellogg, McGann, and Paulson said, it's a great book. We like it. The one lone holdout was W.W. W. Prescott. And he said, it's the most dangerous book I've ever seen. I pray that it will never see the light of day. So, I'm getting distracted here, but this is a fun story. Anyhow, <laughs> so, uh, the, the General Conference Executive Committee said, no, nope, we're not going to, they, they went with, with the minority. And they said, no, no, we're not going to print that. Kellogg said, okay, fine. Took his manuscript, walked out of one door, went around the corner, walked in the other door, same building, to the commercial desk of the Review and Herald, and said, hey, will you print this for me? And they said, sure. <laughs> uh, the printing plates were on the, uh, on the floor of the press room, December 30, 1902, when the Review and Herald burnt down. But um, no, that's not what broke the back of the rebellion. You'll probably remember, yeah, I'm, I'm, you've probably heard the story. What's that? Well, I'll tell you what I thought you would have said. <laughs> How many of you remember the iceberg? You know, the ship sailing through the night and the lookout high in the iceberg dead ahead. Yes. And the captain of the ship said, meet it. meet it. Okay. This was 1902. You know what year the Titanic sank? 1912. Do you know why the Titanic sank? Because the captain tried to steer around the iceberg. And he scraped his entire starboard side and it popped 17 of the watertight compartments out of only 24 on the ship. Guaranteed to go down that way. Sorry about that. It did. If he'd rammed it like Ellen White's vision, yeah, yeah, you, you know, he would have lost a half dozen watertight compartments, but the ship would have been fine. I mean, well, not fine, but you know, ship would have been on the upside of the water. But anyhow, if you'd asked me some years ago, you know, what stopped Kellogg? I would have said that. That happened in the fall of 1902. No, three. 1903. After the... And I, I, I really would have, I would have told you, oh, that, that, what, that's what stopped it. That's not what stopped it. But the story's never been written up until my book, Tactics. It's... And I got it straight from... A.G. Daniels' personal letters. It's, it's an amazing story. So I'll try to give you a little of that here real quickly because this is what needed to be surgically removed. Kellogg, the alpha of apostasy, right? Pantheism and all that went with it. And there's a lot that went with it. So it came to a head over this. Kellogg first began to advocate for the Battle Creek schools, a great missionary system conducted in connection with the famous Battle Creek Sanitarium. He was offering young Adventist youth the opportunity to earn their way through a college education. 40 different subjects they could study and master right there in connection with the sanitarium. Why was he doing this? Because he desperately needed cheap labor. <laughs> and college students preferred, uh, afforded cheap, cheap labor. Ellen White was writing, don't send your youth to Battle Creek. Kellogg said, yeah, that's going really, to really hurt. I need, I need the cheap labor. And so he came up with this idea. It was briefly agitated in 1903. And Ellen White and A.G. Daniels and a few people they addressed it, and they, they said, no, 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 that's not a good thing. And Kellogg let it die out. But he really, really, really needed cheap labor because he's trying to rebuild the sanitarium after the fire and all that sort of stuff. You know, he wasn't flush with cash. 1905, the fall of 1905, he hits, hits it with a big media blast, okay? Um, let me read you some of this. <clears throat> Nowhere else in the world are such splendid opportunities offered as here for a thorough and many-sided training at so small a cost. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just now there is opportunity for a limited number of earnest men and women of mature years and established character to matriculate in these schools. Now, that mature years and established character line was his way of trying to put a little window dressing on it to tell you know, Ellen White and other critics, oh, no, 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 I'm not attracting young, impressionable, I'm, I only want the mature ones. Oh, hogwash. He was, he was taking anybody he could get. Uh, just now, there is set before you the privilege of elevating yourself from the lowest round of the ladder to the greatest heights to which you are capable of climbing, all without money. Do not slight this opportunity. Write at once for our illustrated catalog. Well, okay. <clears throat> That's nice. And I'm missing so much of the story, it's just like, I can, I can hardly bear it, but I'll just give you some selections. This is, well, I, I, I can't really tell, I'm just going to read you A.G. Daniels' letters. Okay. okay. So, this is A.G. Daniels, General Conference President, okay. I seriously fear that for some months we have been losing ground in this controversy. He's writing to Willie White, knowing that Willie would read it to Ellen White. While we have been silent, they have been aggressive. Their efforts have not been open and frank. They are moving under cover, and they are gaining ground. They press their warfare untiringly in all directions. Everywhere we go, we run into it. Now and then someone sends us letters or copies of letters sent out from Battle Creek, which are absolutely untrue, altogether deceiving and undermining in their character. And from all sources, we learn of our young people going there. These things force the issue upon us. The spirit of prophecy has warned our young people not to go to Battle Creek. Dr. Kellogg has determined that they shall go there, and they are going. For one, I feel that this denomination ought to rise up in the name of God and stop this thing. To Elder Daniel's letter, Ellen White responded, I have light from the Lord that at this time we must act with great caution. <laughs> For the enemy is watching our every movement. At times, I have been ready to take steps that would be called aggressive. I would read over the letters containing warning and caution that I have had from the Lord for several in Battle Creek. At times, I have felt that I must print all the warnings given me for Dr. Kellogg. I'm positive she must have said that at least 20 times going through her correspondence. Says, I feel I must now print everything. And, and she never did it. <laughs> she never did it. But I have not yet done this because I have been impressed to wait. If I should make a strong move in this direction, the battle would be on. Those who are opposing the light God has given would feel that they had been attacked, and they would claim that they were compelled to make moves that otherwise they would not have made, and it would take much of our time to meet the issue. Now, I want you to recognize something here. This is a chess game. Yeah. You know, sometimes we get the idea that the Lord's work is like a little butterfly flying from one flower to the next. It's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let us hold on patiently for a little while and let the elements break forth that are struggling into life. Let not too many articles be published in the Review and Herald that are of a character to stir up strife. Now she's writing to Daniels and Prescott. Prescott was editor of the Review. So here's a question for you. How many articles does it take in the review to stir up strife? <laughs> she says, don't put too many in. What's the right number? Ah, he's got her tearing her hair out. Okay. I uh, skipped a bunch there, but Ellen White wrote a different letter now. Some who have been deceived by men in responsible places will repent and be converted. And in all our dealings with them, we must remember that none of those who are in the depth of Satan's snare know that they are there. Well. Yeah, I never cease to be amazed at Ellen White's ability to retain a soul-winning focus. Mm -hmm. 
right to the bitter end. <laughs> It's, 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 it's just absolutely stunning as you read through the record. Ellen White again. Friends of the doctor were visiting our churches acting as spies to work up a sentiment favorable to his interests. They claimed that he was in perfect harmony with the message as we believe it and that he believed the testimonies. A work of deception was being carried on. Many of our people were becoming confused. Now, this is not hard to believe that they were confused. What is this? Is 1906? Ten years before, Kellogg was hands down the strongest defender of the spirit of prophecy in Battle Creek. Far ahead of anybody at the Review or anybody at the General Conference at that point. But this is ten years later. And now he's not. And now there's a work of deception being carried on. I said to those who urged immediate action, do not act hastily. It will be better to wait until Dr. Kellogg and his associates take the position that they do not believe the testimonies. When this time comes, we are to be prepared with suitable matter for publication to meet the issue. This is very strategic. Now, the, the concept of strategy is simply to maximize the military value of the assets that you've got. You know, I've only got so many guys in my army. I've got so many tanks. I've got so many planes. I can just, hey, let's all go attack somebody and get them all blown up on one day, and that's not very good. <laughs> or you can deal strategically. And that's what's happening here. Later, she would describe that time period. Long ago, some thought that the time had come when we must take decided action to break the spell. But in the visions of the night, I was in an assembly of the physicians, and I saw the work that was being planned. Then I said to my son, I must get everything in readiness, for soon we shall see the necessity of having the armor on ready for action. In that meeting, many things were said which I can and must meet. I must work, must now work. And work we did. So this is more or less down through the time period of the fall of 1905. And oh, I, you know, a whole bunch of, of Daniel's letters you know, this is the greatest sorrow of my life, seeing the, the flower of the youth of the church being sucked into this thing and destroyed. He says, you know, I don't know how many people I've met that sent their children off to Battle Creek only to have them turned into infidels. Now, let me just point out the Daniels didn't really like Kellogg, and Kellogg didn't really like Daniels, and there might have been a bit of a human element in this interaction, too. People are complicated. i just, just just throw that out there for you. People, people can be a little complicated at times. So now we switch. This is Willie Wright writing. Elder Daniels tells me of a telegram from Mother asking him to wait in Battle Creek until, the, until manuscripts arrived, which were mailed December 21st. On the 21st of December, 1905, Ellen was awakened early in the morning with instructions, get this one, get this one, get this one, get this one, get this one. Get those manuscripts together, get them retyped, get them into an envelope, get them on the afternoon mail train, go! Now! Get them to Battle Creek! And actually, Doris Robinson was given the package, and it's the dun 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 dun, dun <laughs> down to, to the train station, and he barely gets them on the train. And then he went to the telegraph office, and he wrote to um, Daniels, telegraphed, t telegrammed to Daniels, and said, Mother, Ellen White, Mother says, stay in Battle Creek until manuscripts arrive. Well, he wasn't in Battle Creek, he was in Chicago. But he beat it on up to Battle Creek in the next day or two. I mean, he knew it was going to take a little while. The Pony Express is only so fast, right? But, you know. 
Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I just skipped all that. I gotta tell you this. So, <laughs> uh, December 26th, day after Christmas, Kellogg is in Battle Creek and he goes to the office of the Dime Tabernacle looking for the manuscripts. They aren't there yet. He's standing there and a doctor from the sanitarium comes up to him and says, Elder Daniels, I'm glad to see you. I need your help. I need you to tell me how to know which part of Ellen White's writing is testimony and which part is simply her understanding. And Daniel said, I don't know how to do that. And the guy said, I am hopelessly lost and confused. I'm ready to become an infidel. The night before, Christmas Day, Adventists didn't used to celebrate Christmas much, just kind of as a side note, but you know, Christmas Day at five o'clock, Dr. Kellogg had gathered a number of individuals to a meeting in the sanitarium. And he had spoken to them from five o'clock until a little after 11, during which he explained how much he loved Ellen White and how highly he thought of her prophetic gift, but that there were things that weren't testimony. There was testimony, and then there was other stuff. And that other stuff sometimes came from what people might tell her. I mean, maybe they were honest in telling her that, but you know, it may not be so. But you know, what she was told would end up in a letter. And, and unfortunately, we have people who think that everything that goes into the letter is, is like testimony. Daniel says that Kellogg showed them many, uh, what was the word, uh, infallible proofs of this. <laughs> many infallible proofs that Ellen White would sometimes write wrong stuff. And the doctor, this is not Dr. Kellogg, but this doctor that came up to Daniels, he said, I, you know, I've been raised an Adventist all my life. I've been told that Something from Ellen White was like straight from the courts of heaven. But after what I listened to last night, I, I don't have a clue. How, do I, how am I supposed to figure this out? You need to help me. And Daniel said, I don't know how to figure that out. I don't believe it, but I don't know how to figure it out. But the guy had seen so many infallible proofs. And just then, somebody comes walking through the door with some mail. And there was a parcel with manuscripts from Elmshaven. They handed it to Daniels and he saw an opportunity. So he handed it to the doctor. He said, you open it. So he opens it. He says, you look it over. See what you can figure out. There were four manuscripts, five, five manuscripts. He read the titles, he read the dates, he looked at the signatures, leafed through, and he said, I, I don't know. I don't know how to tell. And Cal or Daniel said, neither do I. He says, either I believe her or I don't. And the doctor said, I get it. I get it. Either I have faith that she's God's messenger, or I don't. And he went away happy, because the question was answered in his mind. And I want you to realize that was the distinction between one-third of the angels and two-thirds of the angels. Exactly the same issue. You don't have proof, but who do you trust? 
Okay. Daniel's writing, the people had heard that the communications were coming from Sister White and were all anxious to hear them. At 7.30, the tabernacle was filled, the auditorium, the vestries, and the gallery. I did not see Dr. Kellogg, but I saw W.K., Dr. Paulson, Elder Jones, Elder Taylor, other leading men. We first had a very earnest season of prayer. Then I read the telegram that I had received from Sister White and proceeded to read the communications. I read both of them without a comment. This is A.G. Daniels, correct. The people listened with breathless interest, and the power and authority of the living God accompanied the message. There was a deep hush and a solemn silence that I have seldom witnessed in a congregation. It seemed to me, as I read, that I never felt the burning power of words reaching my own soul as these words did. I should have said, that when the general meeting closed, after he read the manuscripts, I'm sorry, I skipped some stuff, so it's a little disjointed here, but when the general meeting closed, three men who had been in the meeting with Dr. Kellogg the night before, from 5 to 11 o'clock, came forward and told me that the meeting held the previous night had been clearly described by the testimony I had read, <coughs> entitled, The Result of a Failure to Heed God's Warnings. And they said if there had been a doubt in their minds regarding the source of the testimonies, it would have been swept away by their own statements in the testimonies. What? Ellen White had quoted them from that meeting. That manuscript had been written in 1904. Daniels, I have talked with a number who were in the meeting, and I can but believe that Sister White was stirred up by the Lord on the very day that she caused this message to be written and posted to us for the purpose of letting, getting it into our hands on the very day that it arrived. It is profoundly impressive to look at the facts. The message was written in her diary January 1, 1904, almost two years ago. Thursday morning, December 21, 1905, she was roused to have that message copied from her diary and posted to Battle Creek. The work was done and the telegram sent at 11 o'clock that night. Monday night, December 25, a private meeting was held with the leading men in a room in the college. This meeting was of such a nature that a number have told me that if they had not been well grounded, they would have been turned away entirely from the testimonies. One said that he would be driven to infidelity if he believed the things he, the doctor related to them. Early the next morning, after this meeting was held, the message was in our hands, and in 24 hours after these misleading, bewildering, confusing representations were made to a few men privately, they were openly exposed to nearly 2,000 people. <laughs> men might say what they like, may say what they like. I believe we have a living God, the author of such coincidences as these. I am deeply impressed. The authority and power of the Infinite One came to us last night. Victory was has been given to this cause and it will be worked out now in the Lord's own way. I believe that the fear and restraint that has been upon many has been broken and that now they will stand calmly and fearlessly without wavering in defense of the truth of God. That's when the back of the rebellion was broken. And that story was never, I, I don't know why. I, I have not a clue how that didn't make it into our standard Adventist history books, but it's not there. It's only from Daniel's letters that I know of the story. And in a brief mention or a passage, uh, Willie White mentioned some side effects or side issues of the thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it's attested by numerous authors, but it's Daniel's that gives the account. Amazing. The alpha of apostasy needed to be surgically removed from God's church. <laughs> it, it wasn't quite over yet. Um, but the opposition was becoming increasingly desperate. One of Kellogg's lieutenants uh, a gentleman by the name of Frank Belden. Anybody recognize the name? Him writer. And what else was he? Ellen White's nephew. Yeah. Frank Belden wrote an anonymous letter to Ellen White. Uh, 
that would have been completely damning evidence against Dr. Kellogg in a related conflict going on. Kellogg was trying to gain legal control over the tabernacle, the Battle Creek Tabernacle, through uh, some machinations on the Board of Elders. He was trying to get legal control. And this letter was written anonymously to Ellen White with evidence that just would have destroyed Kellogg if it had been true. But it wasn't true. And the hope was that she would write it as testimony. But she didn't pay attention to sources like that, so she just ignored it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, even butterflies have to deal with spiders sometimes. Okay? <laughs> Do that, you follow what I'm saying? You know, you're never going to, you're, you're not going to get through this battle, not the closing scenes of this battle, without knowing there's a battle on. Well, let's see. Let's go on. <clears throat> hmm, that got out of format. I don't know why that happened, but that's okay. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support surgically removed. That's in Desire of Ages. You know, I used to teach freshman Bible out of Desire of Ages. So I'd run into this every year. And I would read that and I would think, Man, that's going to be tough. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a serious trial. Every earthly well, what's an earthly support? Anything short of God. Mother, father. Mother, father, paycheck. Uh, you know, police protection, perhaps. You know, equal opportunity before the law. <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, you know, the ability to go to Walmart and buy food cheap. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Every earthly support will be cut off. I think, why? Wow, that's 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 a tough deal. And then I was reading one time and I ran into this statement. It is safe to let go every earthly support and take the hand of him who lifted up and saved the sinking disciple on the stormy sea. And I thought, well, that's encouraging. You know, it's safe. But, you know, I'm a real curious guy and it's so easy in these things these days. So I said, yeah, I wonder... If she ever says anything more about every earthly support. So, you know, quotation mark, every earthly support, hit. Okay? Yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. We can never perfect a round, full Christian experience until every earthly support is removed and the soul centers its entire affections about God. Which is kind of obvious when you stop and think about it. You know, when was the last time that a Christian, you know, had a real good reason to be depending on the world for support? But it, it sort of casts it in a little different light, you know? And instead of, oh no, it's going to be a terrible experience. It's like, oh yeah, actually, that's what I've been aiming for. <laughs> that's what I want to do. <clears throat> Earthly support needs to be surgically removed. And the desire for earthly support needs to be surgically removed. It's not in here, but maybe I'll come back to that. I just thought something else that should be in here, but it's not... Pray much for those you are trying to help. Let them see that your dependence is upon a higher power and you will win souls. Okay, so that's nice advice. Praying is always in season. But here's a quick question for you. 
how can you let someone else see that your dependence is upon a higher power? How do you do that? I don't even hear crickets or cicadas right now. I mean, <laughs> What's that? You give God the glory. Give God the glory? Yes. But that's said, they're, they're hearing that. They're not seeing it quite so much. What's that? By the way you live. Yeah, but, but what is that way? What is, what is the definitive proof that your dependence is on a higher power? Not the earthly support. Total surrender. How do how does the next person over get to see that? Let me suggest that the only time they can see it is when it's obvious that you're doing it. It's like you cannot live that way. You know, it, it's a crime. Right? You know, no visible means of support, right? That's what they busted Al Capone on. That and tax evasion, okay? They couldn't bust him on any of his crimes. So they charged him with no visible means of support and tax evasion. But as things ramp up, I saw your hand, I'll get back to you. As, as things ramp up and persecution increases, we will all be eventually with no... Not only no visible means of support, no earthly means of support. We should be dead. We can't buy or sell. You know, we can't hold a job. We can't, you know. And somehow, the guy's still here. Being helpful. And he's being helpful, yes. Yes, in the back. I was going to say, medical missionary work is the last, the last work you're not working, and you, but yet you're out there serving and helping other people with money that you don't have, they're going to know where your heart really is. Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe without money that you don't have, too. <laughs> I'm just playing with your words there. But, but yeah, you know, so I, 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 I illustrate this with, you know, a bit of a, maybe a corny illustration, but... You know, when, when things get tough and everything hits the fan, as the saying goes, and people are hungry, and you've got a sandwich, you give that sandwich to the next guy over. And it's interesting, it's, I don't have the statement on this, but Ellen White speaks of men and women, no, good-hearted good-hearted men and women who still desire to do good to their neighbor. She, she speaks about them right up into the, the little time of trouble. Those are the ones you're looking for, okay? And when you give this guy a sandwich, he says, I can't take your food. You're going to be hungry. It's your sandwich. And you get to say, my bread and water is sure. You don't have that. You need the sandwich. But if you'd like a little Bible study <laughs> on how your bread and water can be sure, I'd be happy to meet with you this afternoon. <laughs> yes? Well, I was going to say, if you haven't been kicked off your land, that uh, tomato sandwich might have been made by the ones that you grow in your garden. Yeah? That were to be yeah? Like that? Yes, comment. George Mueller was an excellent example of someone that only went by faith and when he died there were thousands that respected him yes uh, he, Mueller is an interesting case uh, nothing but respect for the man but Ellen White said that is not our model to follow now I suspect it may be more our model to follow in times of extremity okay but it's so interesting because she said Mueller refused to let people know of his needs and God's people need to know of the needs of God's cause because all the, all the church members who may not have an active role in foreign missions or whatever else, they need that 
participatory opportunity to support God's work. And so that, that was her objection to Mueller. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but, but you're right. Mueller's faith is a good model that I think we have to, we have to pay attention to at some point. Okay, pray much for those who are trying to help. Let them see that your dependence is upon a higher power and you will win souls. God desires everyone to understand the hateful character of selfishness and to cooperate with him in guarding his human family against its terrible deceptive power. The first result of the entrance of sin into the world was the birth of principles of selfishness. The design of the gospel is by means of remedial missionary work to confront this evil of selfishness and destroy its destructive power by establishing enterprises of benevolence. Track through on this. Selfishness is a bad thing. The design of the gospel is to confront the evil of selfishness. By what means? remedial missionary work and enterprises of benevolence. Who's the remedy for? Probably us and them, yes. But, but I would argue it's probably most clearly directed to us. It's, it's the selfishness of our hearts that we need to be treating by means of remedial medical missionary work and enterprises of benevolence. So what's an enterprise of benevolence? Anything that helps somebody, basically. It's a good thing. Anybody ever hear, hear of um, bonehead English? Remedial English, remedial math class, right? You know, you, somehow you got into college but you can't write worth a hoot or you don't know, uh, you know any algebra whatsoever. So they give you a remedial class to get you up to speed so you can actually do college level work, see? I kind of think that's what we need. We need a bonehead Christianity class. You know, there's a few details that uh, we know about, but we, we have a hard time really incorporating them into our our daily practice. Things like it's more blessed to give than to receive, for instance. You know, that's, 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 that's a challenge for some of us. But it's literally true. And the work of benevolence to others is the means of destroying the destructive power of selfishness in ourselves, in our own hearts, right? Mm -hmm. It is really the process of healing sinners not just arbitrarily forgiving them but healing them yeah. remember the word sozo i think i mentioned this already right in a military setting there's this policy called need to know it, it makes sense when you stop and think about it Anything that I know that I don't need to know is one more thing the enemy could squeeze out of me by torture. Why, why, you know, why give me a bunch of top secrets so they can torture it out of me? If I don't need to know them, I don't need to know them, right? <clears throat> um, <laughs> I think God works that way too sometimes, to a degree. And the very fact that he's told us a lot of stuff tells me that he expects his people to be involved in the coming battle. He wouldn't tell us stuff that we don't need to know. So there's a few things here that are worth looking at. Every eye in the unfallen universe is bent, we would say focused upon perhaps, bent upon those who profess to be Christ followers. Here in this atom of a world and earnest warfare is going on a battle in which Christ our substitute and surety has engaged in our behalf and conquered now we well I'm gonna stop there for just a second there's something a little odd about that first 
one sentence. No, two sentences. The universe is watching us. Now, you know, every other week they come up with a new figure for how many, uh, how many galaxies there are in the universe. So it's really, you know, my math is no doubt outdated. But if you take the number of galaxies involved uh, in the universe and you divide that by 8 billion, uh, last time I did that little exercise, you still got 20 some thousand galaxies watching just you. If it's divided out evenly. Um, but it's not divided out evenly because they're watching Christ's followers. So, you know, I don't have an exact number on that. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on you. Just, just, you know, if that helps you. Any? <laughs> And he's told us some stuff, okay? Well, here though, everyone's watching us, but then she goes ahead and she says, there's an earnest warfare, okay, that's fine. You know, that would be interesting to watch. But Jesus is the one who did the cool stuff. <laughs> Why would they be watching us? You know, if I were condemned to watch television, I'd probably watch good reruns rather than terrible new material. You know? Here's the answer. Why they're watching us. Jesus has conquered. Now we, Christ's purchased possession, must become soldiers of his cross and conquer in our own behalf on our own account. Conquer in our own behalf on our own account through the power and wisdom given us from above. Okay, good. And we need to know the plan of the battle that we may work in harmony with Christ. Here's a need to know. There's a plan. We need to know the plan. Uh, let me see something once real fast. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> In the character of God's people, a living testimony will be born that will contradict the fallacy of Satan who has declared that the uh, law of Jehovah is arbitrary. Where did we hear that before? And holds its subjects under a cruel bondage. In the character of God's people is the evidence that contradicts that accusation. Remember I said that Jesus couldn't resolve that one? Well, now we start to see why. Mm -hmm. I haven't covered all the details. But in order to heal a sinner, you have to start with a sinner. <laughs> Does that make sense? And that's one thing Jesus never was. He had sinful flesh, but he was never a participatory sinner. Right. And that's the category where the evidence has to come from this time. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons that I know that 7 and 8 are still on the table. <clears throat> the Lord desires through his people to answer Satan's charges by showing the results of obedience to right principles. Yeah. Okay. Notice the details here. That word results. That's the language of cause and effect. That's not the language of an arbitrary situation. You don't have results. You impose results in an arbitrary situation, right? You, you make something happen. Results is what happens naturally, okay? This is not arbitrary. This is like healing a disease. If you obey right health principles, you get healthy. Here God is showing that obedience to what we know, spiritual knowledge, enlarges our faith, supplying the needed nutrient to combat spiritual disease. The results of right principles what are the right principles? Love God, 
love everybody else. <laughs> on this, hang all the law and the prophets. Those are the right principles. Now, love God, love everybody else only works when you believe that God's going to take care of you. And that's what Lucifer lost. God's not taking care of me. He made a mistake. Or he doesn't care. i got to take care of myself. <clears throat> I looked this one up, Vicki. And it's a little different. I found it in Signs of Times, but I went to this one here because it's worded a little bit differently. We, I think that means human beings, were brought into existence because we were needed. God's vast design in the mediatorial economy shows that he has embraced all humanity in his plan. He calls upon men and women to show themselves Christians that they may fill their appointment as agents chosen to carry out his purposes. And now, in our sinful condition, his purpose for us is to demonstrate the reality of his non-arbitrary, immutable law and to prove that forgiveness is still possible. Does that make sense? You track with me. You understand again how difficult that is, right? You come driving into that corner at 120 miles an hour. And, you know, you can drop the legal charges. That part's easy. But can you scrape that guy up off of that tree and put the blood back into him and keep him alive? Can you heal him now? That's harder. <clears throat> Some people have the idea that if you just spend enough time smelling the roses, you don't have to worry about the bees that are buzzing around the bush. <laughs> but there are bees. And sometimes, sometimes you've got to worry about them. The real world, at least in its sinful state, is not quite that sweet. There is the greatest necessity for us to know something of the working of the powers of darkness and of the iniquity that are bounds that we may feel the importance of rising up to the emergencies. Okay? There's a need to know. To know something. Now this is a tricky thing. How much do you want to know about the powers of darkness? Well, there's one clear line that I would encourage you all to stop on the other side of, and that's talking to them. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any value in talking to someone you know is going to lie to you. So, I would recommend that you don't do that. But we need to know something about the working of the powers of darkness. The resources of the enemy are various. And we must not move like blind men or be ignorant of Satan's devices. Those who do not realize their danger because they do not watch will pay with the loss of their souls the penalty of their presumption and their willful ignorance of Satan's devices. I don't want to be there. I don't want to pay with the loss of my soul. Satan can present a counterfeit so closely resembling the truth that it deceives those who are willing to be deceived. Okay. Please raise your hand if you want me to lie to you. <laughs> Nobody here willing to be deceived? Come on. It's fun. <laughs> This statement, by the way, comes from the book um, Great Controversy. What do you suppose... See that, that comma? Uh, English class, first of all. See the word deceived? See the comma? See the other dots? What are those other dots called? That's, that's what it means. What are they called? Ellipsis. Who said ellipsis? 
It's an ellipsis, yes. Okay. That's a three dot ellipsis. If there's a four dot ellipsis, it means it's crossing the end of a, of a sentence. It's like it picks up the extra period from that sentence, okay? No, that's, is it four? Okay, should be three. I don't know, maybe it should be four. I'll have to look. Maybe it does cross. It might be, it, it may well be it does cross there. I try to be cautious, you know, I'm very careful with that, but so it probably does then. Okay, anyhow. So you get from looking at an angle. But what's going to come after that comma is the non-restrictive clause that defines willing to be deceived. What does it take to be willing to be deceived? Great controversy. A lack of faith? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good answer, actually. But she's a little more, you know, higher level, uh, more specific, sort of. Rebellion. Rebellion. Yeah, it certainly fits in that category, but it's not worded like that. In great controversy. In great controversy, what do you think it takes to be willing to be deceived? I think it's the first time I've heard somebody that probably doesn't actually know what the statement says kind of get, get it right. You don't know what the statement says, right? You're not familiar with it? Okay. Those who desire to shun the self-denial and sacrifice demanded by the truth. That's all it takes to be willing to be deceived. Self-denial and self-sacrifice are what Lucifer rebelled over in heaven. He didn't like the idea. I can't side with his rebellion here and expect to be honored as a member of the Lord's army. But you know what? That makes it look like it's, it's not that hard to fall into the category of willing to be deceived. That's probably my number one nomination for scariest statement in the spirit of prophecy. Because I just have a gut level feeling that there's a lot about self-denial and self-sacrifice that I really haven't mastered yet. I'm sure there's a few details. That, that, one's, that one's kind of unnerving. Everything that causes us... Oh, okay, so... Surgically removal. Surgical removal here, right? Uh, a willful ignorance of Satan's devices. And specifically, the deception that I can go forward caring for myself and be okay with that. That deception needs to be removed. <coughs> surgically. Just cut it out. <laughs> okay, another one. Everything that causes us to see the weakness of humanity is in the Lord's purpose to help us look to Him and in no case but trust in man or make flesh our arm. I think the last three or four years have been a smashing success in this regard. <laughs> I have a vastly reduced trust in humanity. <laughs> it's like, I hardly trust them at all. <laughs> and that's actually good if it's tempered properly. How many times did Ellen White quote, CC for man whose trust is, whose strength is, or whose breath is in his nostrils, right? In many ways, Satan is revealing that he, reels, rev, he rules the world. He is influencing the hearts of men and corrupting their minds. Men in high places are giving evidence that their thoughts are evil continually. I can hardly think of any examples of that that you don't already know. <laughs> this is the evening news. 
the Lord is permitting these men to expose one another in their evil deeds. Amazing! And we call it a political campaign. Some of their iniquitous practices are being laid open before the world. That thinking men who still have a desire in their hearts to be honest and just with their fellow men. That's what I was looking for a while ago. Not, not good-hearted men, I think I said. But thinking men and women, in another place she says, thinking men and women, who still have a desire in their hearts to be honest and just with their fellow men. They need to understand why God is bringing, beginning to send his judgments on the earth. And the nightly news is a good primer as to why most of the earth ought to be burned up. Because <laughs> it really kind of stinks. I mean, seriously. If that's the best you can do for a political candidate? Yeah. <laughs> On either side? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sometimes you just kind of have to laugh. Because you'd cry if you didn't. The record of dishonesty and conniving and vileness that has resulted from the investigation into the cases of men holding official positions and which has been opened before all through the courts should certainly open blind eyes and lead us to inquire, whom can we trust? Where can we find men of honor? As these evils are being revealed, even the worldling can see that corruption is filling the earth. Uh, as one egregious example on one side of the divide, not to say it's worse than the other side of the divide, but on one side of the divide, do you know where uh, President Trump, former President Trump, has his strongest support? Which, which demographic? Evangelical Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Because years ago, some prophet said he was going to be president. And he was going to deliver the nation from the ungodless, or the unga yeah, ungodly Democrats. And, you know, get rid of Roe versus Wade. Well, they did that. That was the Supreme Court, but you know what? Give him credit. He, he got three guys on the court. That's what did it, right? And, and you know, it's an awful lot of evangelicals. You cannot shake them. They, they don't pretend that he's a godly man, but he is God's chosen servant. Even the worldling can see that corruption is filling the earth. But instead of calling these men to repentance, the revelations are turning the office holders one against another. I think that's good, really. And they are exposing to the world every species of crime in the lives of judges and jurors and senators alike. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. Satan is at work to corrupt with his deceiving policies the rulers and the people. This work will be carried on from city to city until the guilt of the whole world will be manifest. Wow. I mean, what's yet to come? You know, it's the great North American city to city corruption tour. You know, hey, we get a big bus and we go around and we show a movie. You know, hey, that's what all the... Sell tickets. Yeah, sell tickets. Hey, you know, that's capitalism, baby. <laughs> but we devote it for a good cause. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I think it's interesting that Ellen White describes these evil actors as exposing each other. I don't think God is calling us to spend all our time exposing these guys. They're doing a pretty good job. Let them handle themselves. Right? I don't think we should be utterly ignorant of the corruption in the government or the World Economic Forum or Big Pharma or just about every other identifiable entity. But I think he's going to take care of the job of exposing them or get them to ex expose each other, right? 
for us to fail to see that that's a useful thing strikes me as really dumb. Okay? And the last thing I'm going to be doing is going around papering over anybody's weaknesses. Let the weaknesses be seen. Put the cards on the table. Face up. Okay, going on. God has designed that these revelations should be made, and that those who read the accounts of them may understand that men's sins have reached unto heaven. Well, I would say from that, that trust in worldly men and the organizations that worldly men form needs to be surgically removed. <laughs> Just get rid of it. I, uh, I am utterly amazed at Adventists who somehow hold out hope for the political system at the moment. <laughs> It, it's just like, seriously? You know, you, you think you got a dog in this fight? I don't think you've got a dog in this fight. You've got two dogs, but they're both hounds from hell. You know? <laughs> there is another caution along these lines that cuts a little closer to home. If we are to bear a part in this work to its close, we must recognize the fact that there are good things to come to the people of God in a way that we had not discerned. That's good. And that there will be resistance from the very ones we least expected to engage in such a work. Resistance. That's a, a fascinating word. Resistance. Not persecution. Not... I don't know. It's, not, it's just resistance. Just, just an interesting word. There will be resistance from some that we would not have expected. Before the great trouble shall come upon the world, such as never been since there was a nation, those who have faltered and who would ignorantly lead in unsafe paths will reveal this before the real vital test. <coughs> Comma, the last proving. The real vital test is the last proving. Okay? Saying that's, that's your non-restrictive, you know, added information. Those who have faltered, would lead ignorantly, will reveal this before the real vital test, the last proving comes, so that whatsoever, what, yeah, whatsoever they may say will not be regarded as voicing the true shepherd. We have no time to lose in walking through clouds of doubt and uncertainty because of uncertain voices. I don't know that I'm in a position to completely define that or, or point that out. But I, I'm, I'm pretty clear that my dependence upon or attention to uncertain voices needs to be surgically removed. If God's going to go to that degree of trouble, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Before the real test comes, it's like something else comes first. And uh, makes it clear which voices to listen to. <clears throat> I'm not a prophet. I think that this process has already begun. Mm -hmm. Primarily in the unquestioning acceptance of human wisdom, quotes, and the unquestioning submission to human authority. We see that in a variety of ways. Some larger than others, some more, some more global than others. And I don't think it's good. Okay, moving along here. If we had faithfully followed from the first, the instruction regarding 
city work. Means would have come in for us to establish in these places schools and small sanitariums where we could treat the sick and preach the gospel and educate the people in Bible truth. So now there's an interesting thing here. An army needs to be supplied. Soldiers can't fight long if they don't have any food. And I find it fascinating that the Lord would specify this kind of detail. It's city work where the money is supposed to come from. Now that's not really hard to figure out in a sense. It's kind of like the old story in Oklahoma. You now the intrepid newspaper reporter interviewing the desperate bank robber. He says, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do we need to work cities? That's where the people are. And coincidentally, that's where the money is. And Ellen White says, I don't know, did I have that one here? Um, I don't know if I have that one or not. Yeah, I do. Okay, we'll get to it. <clears throat> if we had done this, we would have had means to sustain all the enterprises for missionary work that we could carry forward. That's how much money there is in the city. As surely as honest souls will be converted, their means will be consecrated to the Lord's service, and we shall see an increase of our resources. Well, defense is good, and supply lines are important, but the day needs to come when the army actually sets off to win the war. So when do we get around to... So any, any offensive measures, right? We've seen this one before. When the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be setting in operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. Maybe we haven't seen that one today. I thought we had. Bam. <clears throat> this is a statement that I've used for years, okay? So like 14 years ago, we started a nonprofit in Wichita called Adventist City Missions. And I use this statement, you know, when the cities are worked as God would have them, it sets in motion this mighty movement. Uh, <clears throat> but I always stopped right there and I said, ah, oh, she's talking about the loud cry. What a great thing. We need to work the cities and that'll start the loud cry. You know, I still believe that. But um, about three months ago, four months ago, I actually read the rest of the paragraph. <laughs> That's, that's a trick they teach you in, in research class. <laughs> may the Lord give wisdom to our brethren that they may know how to carry forward the work in harmony with His will. Okay, that seems like an innocuous statement. But, yeah, there's a way to do it. And maybe we ought to be asking the Lord to give us the wisdom to know how to do it. Uh, you know, that seems like a great thing. Okay. And there's one more, one more sentence. With mighty power, the cry is to be sounded in our large centers of population. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That caught my attention. This was like the end of March. I was just finishing up my last book, which came out in April. That's, that's the book that has this stuff in it. And, and I used that, sentence, or that, that, that statement about the mighty movement. And I was ready to go on, and I read the rest of the paragraph. And I saw this, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And, and my, my immediate thought was, well, that's really weird that she would use that verse that was fulfilled in 1844 to talk about something future. That's very constructive or very, uh, you know, literary license type of thing. The, the kind of thing that prophets get away with, you know. And then, for the first time in my life, it crossed my mind, and it's like, I'm, I'm, this is like true confessions of an idiot here, but I, I come at everything from Advent's history, right? And behold, the bridegroom cometh, that's, you know, the parable of the ten virgins, that's, that's the midnight cry. 
August 12, Exeter, New Hampshire, you know, Samuel Sheffield snow, 68 days from there to October 22. That's the midnight cry. That's, that's that verse. And the idea that she was talking about something future, I says, that's, that's odd. And just for kicks, I searched for Behold the Bridegroom Cometh. And you know what? She uses that verse easily three, maybe four times as often to talk about the future as she does the past. Totally caught me by surprise. I just, my, my shutters had been on, hadn't seen that at all. What's interesting is she never uses the phrase the midnight cry to talk about the future. When she says midnight cry, that's 1844. Okay. But she uses, behold the bridegroom cometh, she uses the parable of the ten virgins. And there's a lot wrapped up in that thing. <clears throat> this sentence tells us something about how to carry forward the work in harmony with God's will. And what does that say? What does that say? That, that, to me, that sentence says there's a strong emphasis on the second coming here. And this is not... This is not the same kind of emphasis that we've had on the second coming of... Our denomination is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That means that we believe Jesus is coming back soon. <laughs> okay? This is not that. This is, get ready, man! He's coming! <laughs> There's a different tone. <laughs> And I got to thinking about that reference right there. And, and actually, I'll just tell you, I was sitting at my laptop, different table, but I was typing. My, I just finished a chapter, started a brand new chapter, and I, I typed, well, from what we've seen so far, there's a mighty movement coming, uh, you know, brought on by city work or something. But that, opened, that raises a number of questions, like, how is this going to happen? Who's going to start it? You know, and, and, and this kind of thing. I asked a whole bunch of questions. I stopped typing and I just kind of sat back and I thought, hey, I guess I have to go find the answers to those questions now. <laughs> you, know, you ask the questions, you got to go find the answers now. And I, I thought about it for just a second. And it's like a little light bulb went on and I just started typing again. And literally what I wrote was, Actually, those questions are kind of ridiculous. Even a smattering of familiarity with sacred history makes it seem obvious. And then I typed some questions. We'll get there. Come on. How many people built the ark? How many people left, well, who are in charge, you know? How many people left Ur of the Chaldees or led Israel out of Egypt? How many people stood up against the Midianites or fought Goliath? How many people stood on the plain of Dura or announced the coming of the Lamb of God? How many nailed 95 theses on their local church door? How many started the Millerite movement? How many started the Seventh-day Adventist church? And, you know, yes, we don't know how many people were involved in building the ark. That's true. There were many workmen. But it was pretty much Noah was the general contractor. <laughs> you know, we can get the number up to 300 if we count all of Gideon's army. <laughs> but this just really struck me. This mighty movement is not going to come from central planning. Nobody plans on Martin Luther showing up. Nobody budgets for Martin Luther. <clears throat> and in our five-year economic plan, we need to consider the expansion of the Reformation. <laughs> Nobody does that. You don't schedule Martin. <laughs> he just shows up. <clears throat> this next statement doesn't talk about the ten virgins but it's closely related <clears throat> you 
You are getting the coming of the Lord too far off. I saw the latter rain was coming as suddenly as the midnight cry and with ten times the power. How sudden was the midnight cry? It was the difference between August 14 and August 15. <laughs> Now, its duration was like 68 days or some such thing. Yeah, 68 days. I don't think that means that the loud cry, the latter rain, is going to be 68 days long. I don't, I don't know that that's the case. But it's going to come suddenly. Which inclines me to think it's going to be somebody like Martin Luther. Somebody... Is going to figure out how to do what we haven't figured out how to do yet. With mighty power, the cry is again to be sounded in our large centers of population. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. How do you do that? You know? How many times have you seen the, the cartoons of the, the old guy with the beard and the big sign, the end is near? We make jokes out of that. How do you do it and have anybody take you seriously? Somebody's going to figure that out. It might be a small group. Yeah. Question, comment. Somebody's just going to do it. Somebody's just going to do it. But probably not someone the elected. <laughs> no, no, probably not. Medical missionaries are to go forth. Workers in every line are to proclaim, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise, five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. I never knew that. I, I, honestly, I, I just, this was like the most stunning thing for, you know, six months type of thing. Is it? Oh, that's in, the, that's in the future, too. I, it was completely out of my frame of reference. Has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a special application to this time. And, like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. I seem to have my mind carried, for, carried to the future. When the signal will be given, announcing, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ahead to meet him. But some people had delayed to obtain the oil to replenish their lamps, and too late they find that character, which is represented by the oil, is not transferable. The parable of the ten virgins is given to us that we may understand that there is an hour when the gates are closed. <clears throat> this was stunning to me and, and you know I may be viewing it in the wrong light to some degree in some way but behold the bridegroom cometh it's Matthew 25 if you're looking it up behold the bridegroom cometh was the midnight cry the cry went forth at midnight and from that point on no one's spiritual condition changed you either had the oil or you didn't when behold the bridegroom cometh is announced in that parable That's too late, yeah. Nothing's changing now. Five had extra oil, five didn't. Now the foolish virgins, they don't realize their danger until quite a bit later when they finally, you know, they've gone to Walmart and back and they come to the feast and they don't get in. But, but their case is decided when the cry is given, behold, the bridegroom cometh. 
And behold, the bridegroom cometh is the cry that stirs up the cities of the world and starts the mighty movement. And it's done by medical missionaries. The foolish virgins, virgins represent those who claim to be children of God but who do not practice it. These have not a burden for souls. They do not deny self. They do not lift the cross of Christ. They are seeking to have an enjoyable time with the world while claiming to be Christians. Probably a very bad idea. This is no time for the messengers of God to stop to prop up those who know the truth and who have every advantage. Let them go on to lift the standard and give the warning. Behold, the bride and cometh. Go ye out to meet him. It's like you don't spend your time working with a lost cause. <clears throat> when life is going on and it's unvarying round, when men are absorbed in pleasure, in business, in traffic, in money making, when religious leaders are magnifying the world's progress and enlightenment, and the people are lulled in a false security, then, as the midnight thief steals within the unguarded dwelling, so shall sudden destruction come upon the careless and ungodly, and they shall not escape. Now that statement depicts a close of probation in a time of sort of relative normalcy. Life is going on and it's unvarying round. People are buying and selling and marrying, giving in marriage and, you know, whatever else. Um, where I live, normal ended about four years ago. <laughs> but, you know, things have calmed down a bit and, and maybe, maybe things will come back around to normal, right? Maybe. But nonetheless, probation is closing for some and it's, that happens in this, this normal state of society. But normal doesn't last long once the announcement is made about the bridegroom. When the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, they received an unexpected denial. The master of the feast declared, I know you not. They were left standing without in the empty street in the blackness of the night. That's a really grim picture. But the only thing you could do is, you know, add a rainstorm to it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to end up there. And, and, and that raises a question. In reading this parable, one cannot but pity the foolish virgins and ask the question, why is it that the wise did not divide their supply of oil? But as we make the spiritual application of the parable, we can see the reason. It is not possible for those who have faith. <laughs> Faith's a big thing. Might have caught that. And grace to divide their supply with those who have not. It's no hard-heartedness on the part of the wise virgins. It just can't be done. The foolish virgins don't have faith. They could never actually accept grace because that comes through faith too. When it came down to it, they just don't trust God enough to do as he suggested. They were still trying to have that happy time with the world. But not everyone's probation closes in a, a normal time. The great majority of people are so ignorant of what's coming that they need someone to grab them by the shoulders and give them a shake. Some of them will listen. But God's going to help us with that because, like I say, normal is not going to last. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who have no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. 
large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. So now, um, there's a very similar statement to this. It shows up in volume 9 of the testimonies. So I've been aware of that one for years. This one has a little wording differently. That's why I put it in here. But the thing is, I never knew where to put that statement on my little, you know, last days eschatological chart. I thought, where does that fit? Now I think I know. It comes right after the medical missionary workers take the message of the second coming to the large cities of the world. What this statement calls God's destructive judgments is what happens when Lucifer sees that we've turned our attention to the large cities. Sometimes, quite a few times, inspiration, some are, for whatever reasons, allows God's permissive will to be portrayed as if it was his active will. Does that make sense? He takes the blame for hardening Pharaoh's heart, so to speak. That's not what he wanted to have happen. But, whatever, okay? So here, this talks about God's destructive judgments. I think there's a different side to that. As Lucifer sees that we are making efforts to work the cities as if we meant to give the last message. Do, do you pick up a little sarcasm there? You know, is it okay for Ellen White to be sarcastic? <laughs> it's very slight, very subtle. But it's like, oh, come on, guys. Let's do it for real this time. As Lucifer sees that we are making efforts to work the cities as if we meant to give the last message, his wrath will be aroused and he will employ every device in his power to hinder the work. Lucifer is worried about cities. There's a lot of unhappy campers there. If somebody ever gets around to showing them something that's better than what they're wasting their time with now, I think Lucifer knows he's he's at risk. Why does she call him Lucifer on that statement? Satan? No, I wonder why she calls him Lucifer. Oh, why does she call him Lucifer instead of Satan? Yeah, I don't know. I, I've not been able to identify uh, a fixed criteria for her use. She, she usually re refers to Satan, but there are times when Lucifer pops back up. It's, it's it's an interesting question. I don't have a good answer for you. Sorry, though. Good question. In that first paragraph, is that indicating that probation is closing then first for those who profess to know God? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, actually, that statement in Volume 9 I've heard all my life is described as the close of probation for the Adventist Church. And to me, yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't believe in a, a punctilinear close of probation. You know, it's not like the buzzer going off at the end of a basketball game, right? Nobody's going to, you know, sink a half-court three-point buzzer beater, you know, and win the game that way. That's just not, no, that's, that's not how it happens. It's if not you're arbitrary. If you're looking at that as Seventh-day Adventist, why is it in Revelation, it says that the angel ascends back to heaven and says that he has sealed 144,000, and then the censors throw down into the clothes. But you just mentioned that in volume 9, it's saying that it's taking place before the rest of the world. According to Revelation, it's the very end of the 144,000 are sealed. Um, I, I would like to explore with you your thought on the very end part. Okay, um, that's a whole different sermon. <laughs> uh, uh, let me just offer the, the possibility that the ceiling may precede the very end by a, a, a stretch of time. Just, just offer that thought and just leave it there for right being, but maybe we can talk and have a chat. We'll see what we can make out of that one. Um, okay, that's the same statement there. Um, what's going on? I think I got a duplicate page. That's, that's just, we don't need that. 
I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them, but rather in this way. They place themselves beyond his protection. He warns, corrects, reproves, and points out the only, safe, the only path of safety. If they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress, sweeping off multitudes to make sure of his prey. So that's just kind of establishing that. Uh, yes, question, comment? Well, just oftentimes we use the word Satan, and, but that's an inclusive thing of, of him and his imps. Yeah. Whereas Lucifer, the word, it is... He sees himself. That's an interesting thought. That 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 may be uh, for his own life. That may be a, 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 an angle to an, analyze it from. Let me. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that. That's a good thought. I never I never thought of it that way before. That's good. Um, okay. We are still in a battle. It will not be pleasant. It will not be pretty. But the Lord has given us some guidance and some warning beforehand, and. I left out one, boy, it's so hard to get everything in. There's an important statement that got left out, and that is, it says that uh, medical missionary work is the door through which the truth is to find entrance into the large cities. And I left that out of here. But that's important, because when, when that, you know, when, when it gets to the point where, you know, as if we meant to give the message to the large cities, we'll, we'll probably be following the directions. Okay, if, if we mean to do it, let's, let's go ahead and break down, read the direction book. And the direction book is medical missionary work, is the door through which the message will find entrance to large cities. So that's why I say it's, it's the medical missionary workers who somehow, in ways that I don't fully understand, I don't, I don't, I barely understand, I, I don't even, I don't think I understand it. I just, I just kind of know the concept. <laughs> you know, Somehow they're going to pick up, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And, and that, you know, those three elements, medical missionary work, large cities, emphasis on second coming, we haven't seen that for a long while. Now I will say this, um, in, a, uh, in a string of developments that's kind of close to my heart, um, to a degree prompted by a book I wrote 12 years ago. Starting in 2014, there was a series of mega clinics. First one was in San Francisco, Oakland in 2014. 2015, there was one in San Antonio. Anybody familiar with these? Okay. 2016 was uh, Spokane. And, uh, you know, no, that came after, right after uh, San Antonio, whatever, 2015, 2016, something like that. And then Phoenix, and Beckley, West Virginia, and Dallas, Fort Worth. And the next one was supposed to be Indianapolis in 2020. Everyone remembers what happened in 2020. You know, those mega clinics... I'm never going to pretend that they are the magic bullet. This is the, this is the answer for the Lord's work. No, but they were medical missionary work, and those were cities. And I think Lucifer came unglued. And uh, I think we'll see more of that. Um... Yes, I was there. Yeah, and just just as an interesting factor, uh, I've been kind of involved with this. I helped them write their not write, but I helped them organize and put their procedural manual together. Because when you run one of those things for three days, you're a hospital. Every law that applies to a hospital applies to you. So it's it's a complex thing to do. And I'm thankful that there are people who have the, the, the wisdom and the knowledge of how to do that. I, I don't. I, I go and I'm a flunky and I help. But uh, uh, I lost my train of thought now. Anyhow. Uh, oh, yes. I was, when we did Los Angeles, I believe we had like 5,500 volunteers. And I think... 
Or maybe it was maybe it was six thousand in Los Angeles, fifty five in Dallas Fort Worth. A year ago we had another one in Phoenix. We'd done one in Phoenix before. I think we had about four thousand volunteers that, that time. A year ago in Phoenix, and then just two weeks ago in Washington, DC, we had three hundred and four hundred and twenty volunteers. That's what's left after COVID. So, you know, um, Gideon started off with 37,000. But he won the war with 300. <laughs> there's, there's weird stuff going on. <laughs> and, and we're in the middle of it. And to pretend that there's anything else that really matters in life? I'm having a hard time seeing it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, let's close. Mm -hmm. Father, we